Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on what time zone you're in. Um, it would be great to get a thumbs up if people can hear me. Great, awesome, good to know. So um, welcome to the first of uh, four webinars that I'm gonna be doing this week. Uh, please feel free to use the chat box and continue to introduce yourself. Um, it's obviously hard for me to look at every one, but um, I am gonna keep this, this chat um, link or the, the chat so that I can kind of follow up with folks as needed. So thanks for introducing yourself. So I just wanna start with some video conference etiquette. Um, you've all been automatically muted upon entry into this webinar. We have over 250 people registered um, and about 100 on right now, so there won't be an opportunity for us to have, unfortunately, verbal dialogue. Um, but of course, please, you're welcome to keep your videos on so that we can see you. If you don't want to keep your video on, that is totally up to you. Obviously, as a facilitator, it is nice to see some nonverbal cues, so I encourage you to keep it on. If you're having a problem hearing me, it could be that the sound on your device is off or low, so you wanna make sure to check that. Um, and I have a trusty helper here in chat box. Could you please write um, if the sound is off to check your uh, volume, that would be great. And um, a couple of other pieces. Uh, Zoom, for those of you that aren't, um, familiar with Zoom has a panel that hopefully you're seeing on your screen or device somewhere. And um, if you can't find the chat box, if you go to more, there's three dots on the right, um, you can open up a chat box and that's where people are posting things. Within the chat box, you also have three dot points um, at the bottom and you can select to just send um, me a chat or a question or the whole group, um, but do understand that it is a little hard to manage questions um, that are going on with so many people on, so we'll do our, we'll do our best. You are more than welcome to ask questions, as I said. Um, I have a trusty helper here. Um, Oh, got it. Okay. Um, and uh, he will be helping manage looking at the chat box and answering questions. Um, and his name is Jamie Sparks, and he is the school health program manager at ETR. If you are new to Zoom, you can actually move your image box around the screen um, to a place that's easy to view. So feel free to do to do that. Um, and you can expand that box by uh, scrolling to the bottom of the images where you're seeing people and expanding it. You can also view people in gallery view, which means there are multiple people that you can view. And because we have so many people, there's an arrow um, and you can actually look at like different frames. Um, so you can't see everyone at once, but you can move through the frames. So, um, and just know if your camera is off, you know, don't worry about it. Your initials show up, so we can't see you. So um, that's all well and good. Some of you have asked about certificates. There is a certificate that I will send out in the Google link. Um, and it's just a certificate of, um, you know, uh, completion. It's just an hour. It, it has the title and the date and my name on it. Um, maybe that's sufficient for you to get a professional development unit, um, but I did not link up with any graduate credits at this point in time. The final housekeeping piece is this is a webinar that is being recorded. I will post it to the Karen Guidance YouTube channel and just want you to know that at the end of the um, 45 minutes to hour of this webinar, all the materials, including this PowerPoint and the YouTube channel um, will be shared via QR code, code so that you will have access to everything. All the materials, again, this PowerPoint um, and the link to the YouTube channel as well. So I'm just gonna get started and begin. This is the first of um, for, as I said, webinar series. And um, today we're gonna be doing foundations of skills-based health education. Uh, tomorrow I'll be talking about the HECAT or the health education curriculum analysis tool and unit planning. On Wednesday we'll be assessing, I'll be talking about assessing students in health education and sharing some rubrics and performance checklists. And then on Thursday, I'll be sharing any no cost or free tools that I know that can, teach, can support you in skills-based health education. 
So a little bit about me, my background is middle school health education teacher. And um, I went to, I left the classroom and went to the Oregon Department of Education to support health education for the state of Oregon. And then about 14 years ago, started my own consulting business. So we work nationally to create places of health and well-being where all people, including students, can be healthy and connected to achieve their full potential. So some of the work that we do is curriculum development and writing. My background is in curriculum instruction and pedagogy and health education. Um, but we also do a lot of broad school health work and whole child work as well. So thrilled to be here and offer these at no cost to health educators. So I want to jump into a little bit of kind of why I wanted to do this content. And um, this is a training that I do. It's a two-day skills-based standards and assessment training that I typically do in person with school districts. Um, as a result of living through this pandemic, I wanted to offer components of the skills-based health education training um, virtually. So that's basically what I'm doing. It is um, not as, I think, effective as being in person to Together, but it's at least something. So I wanted to start by talking about a foundation and a foundation of a building is something that is structurally sound. And what we're going to be talking about today are the basic building blocks of skills-based health education. And this information might be a review or redundant to some of you, but to some of you, it might be an introduction. So um, I'm hoping that, some, that all of you can get something out of this. So in order to begin and to find out where all of you are, I'm gonna do a poll. Now, some of you might be um, more familiar with polls that you send in a text to. This one is a little bit different. So what I'd like for you to do is either grab a phone or use the device that you're on and type in the web, open up your web browser and type in sli.do, just like you see on this screen right here. And it's going to prompt you to type in a number. And you can see it on the screen as well. Another option is you can hold your phone up to the QR code that you're seeing on the screen right now, and it will bring you directly to the poll. And the polling question is for you to just rate your comfort level teaching to the national health education standards, where one is that you're not at all comfortable, and 10 is that you're extremely comfortable. I'm gonna give people a few minutes to do that. We should be seeing some things popping in. Here we go. I'm gonna mute myself for a second as people have a chance to get to sli.do or Slido and answer this question. Okay, so it sound, looks like there's still uh, some data coming in, but um, overall it looks like um, majority of you are fairly comfortable teaching to the National Health Education Standards. Um, some of you might be very new, so it's great to have some of you on board, uh, just being here to learn more. Um, and some of you are feeling extremely comfortable, so we still have a lot of data coming in. It's moving around a little bit, so we'll, we'll wait a, another 30 seconds or so. I'm looking at my phone because if, if you're not familiar with Slido, um, I just was introduced to it a couple weeks ago um, as a way to obviously do polling. And it's interesting because you use your cell phone as the remote. So I can actually go to the next um, question once we have uh, these data um, through my phone and it actually automatically pops it up on the screen for you. So it's just a really interesting uh, new technology that I'm learning how to use as well. 
So um, thank you for uh, answering that question. It's still, uh, still some data coming in, but overall, I'd say a bulk of you are fairly comfortable teaching to the standards overall. Uh, you might not consider yourself an expert, but overall you have some comfort there. So thank you for uh, doing that poll. I'm gonna close that poll. And if you keep your phone or your device or your browser open, I have one more question right now. And that question is to rate your confidence explaining what skills-based health education is. So if someone were to say to you, I know what health ed is, but what does skills-based mean? Would you feel comfortable and confident explaining skills-based? So go ahead and I'll mute myself for about 30 seconds as these data come in. Okay, so this is really helpful now. We're all across the board on this one. So um, many of you are pretty comfortable talking about skills-based health education, um, but some of you might not be. So it looks like we kind of are all over the board for this one. So I'm gonna close this poll, bring us back to our slide deck. And just basically talk about what I think the goal of health education is. And I think that this would basically be a universal belief or value for most of you. You may define it a little bit differently, but really we want students to gain the knowledge and master the skills that will help them adopt and maintain healthy lives. Like overall, that's kind of what we're looking for. And, you know, we may talk about, um, you know, specific skills or specific content that students have uh, that they'll take with them when they leave the K-12 or, you know, uh, college level, but, you know, overall, just as a math teacher isn't held accountable for you mastering balancing your checkbook every single month, they still hope that you know how to do it. And, you know, as a health educator, you're not held res responsible or accountable for students and adults' behaviors to be taught um, in the future, but you still hope that the skills and the knowledge that you teach them uh, stays true. So that's kind of what we're looking for when we talk about health education. So furthermore, what is skills-based health education? And there's been a paradigm shift in what it used to look like. And right now, we define it as being engaging, relevant, student-centered, and focusing on skills. And in order to do that, I wanna just briefly go back in history about 110 years ago. So recently, uh, an old friend sent me this book, and this book is from 1909. And it is for good, it's good health for girls and boys. And it has been fascinating to flip through. Um, so let me show you a couple of the chapters in the book. So you can see some of the chapters look very similar to what we continue to teach now, you know, tobacco, um, exercise. Um, the what funniest thing to me that made me laugh was, oh, we have chapter fours on good positions, which interestingly enough has nothing to do with sex education, thank goodness. <laughs> but it has to do with how to grow straight. Um, so fascinating that, you know, health education in 1909, yes, we had some similarities, but overall it has changed considerably. Here are some photos from the book. We have like boys playing on a playground and how to sit right um, around back health, which is very important. And then on the right, interestingly enough, we have sweeping, dusting, and dusters, uh, and of course a female. So interesting times um, in 1909, but that is our history when we talk about health education. So when we think about how it's changed over the years, we do have to think about how it's moved forward. So when we're talking about content and skill development, you know, we want to think about how to, um, in a you know, classroom setting, how do we introduce content and skills? How do we allow opportunities for reinforcement and practice of both content and skills? And how do we allow opportunities for students to master and become proficient in both the knowledge and the skill piece? And so when we're talking skills-based health education, that's really what we're talking about. 
So I want to introduce you to a very simple diamond shape. And some of you that have taken my um, classes before, or my trainings before in person have seen this before. It's just really simple. And what I believe uh, this diamond shape demonstrates really the four foundational pieces of health education. Um, and so those are effective practices, which we're going to talk about. national health education standards, data, and policy. And I wanna make sure, thank you, someone just wrote me, it looked like I was in presentation mode, so I wanna make sure that I'm not in presentation mode. That might be helpful, more helpful to see now. I'm hoping a little bit bigger. Is that good, better? Okay, great, I'm seeing some thumbs up. Okay, great, sorry, when it flipped back from Slido, I think it went into uh, my, my other screen. So I wanna make sure that you're in the screen that you need to be. So um, I wanna start with effective practices in health education and talk a little about these. And um, I'm gonna actually introduce kind of three um, uh, tools that are really helpful when we talk about uh, effective practices and appropriate practices in health education, all that are free and online. Again, the URLs will be in the slides. So when you get them, you can go right to them. And I have some, um, and actually all the documents are in the folder as well. So uh, the first one I want to talk about is the essential components of health education. And this is a document from Shape America. And um, it goes over kind of the big picture. So out of all the resources I'm gonna share right now around effective practices, this one focuses on more of the environment that is supporting you in a school or a district. And so it goes over these four components that you can see on the right. I know they're small, um, but they're talking about policy and environment. So are you in an environment where your school is supporting the things that you teach in the classroom? So that when you're teaching bullying prevention, are there bullying policies that support that? When you're teaching nutrient-rich snacks, are there nutrient-rich snacks that are giving out being given out you know, through the food service. So um, that's kind of a bigger picture thought of like, how are you supported? And that we know that health education is more effective when the environment and the policies are supporting what you're teaching. So that's kind of where it starts. And then it talks about curriculum. We'll get deeper dive into some other documents, instruction and student assessment. Now with this document also comes another document that is called the program checklist. So these are kind of the same, they're not the same documents, they're actually separate, but the program checklist is meant to be a checklist to support those essential components. So here's a screenshot, I know it's a little hard to see, of health education program checklist. This is around policy and environment. So it's just a cut off of one page and it allows you to really look at this and say, you know, okay, so does my district require full inclusion for all students in health education? Probably not, unless you're maybe at high school and, you know, at the high school level and, um, you know, it's a requirement for graduation. Like that's, you know, about, um, you know, all we can get. Because I know that there are a lot of middle schools and elementary schools that it doesn't require all. Um, so this is a checklist that can kind of help you go through to see whether these things are in place or not. Um, this document actually might be a great document if you're being interviewed with a district or school to say, hey, I'm curious to know how myself as a health teacher and my health education program might be supported through policy and environment. And it just has kind of a guiding checklist to help you out. So this is the big picture tool that I just wanted to share. It's on Shape America's website. And again, the URL is in the notes on this PowerPoint, which I will uh, share with you after the webinar. The next one that I want to talk about is the appropriate practices in health education. I love this document. Um, this document is um, one that um, goes over a checklist. It's a series of checklists as well, or sorry, it's not a checklist. It's in a table and it has kind of the best practices around creating a good learning environment for your health ed class, the best practices around uh, curriculum. Uh, in health education, instructional strategies, assessment, 
and then advocacy, meaning you as a health teacher, what do you do around advocating for the field of health education? What are those best practices? What will help further not only your program, but holistically as a whole for the entire country? How does that help health education around advocacy? And then there's professionalism. What does it mean to be a, a professional you know, health educator? And so this document is also a Shape America document. And again, it will be in the Google, um, the Google folder and the URL will be in the slides. And then the last one is kind of the deeper dive um, into the characteristics of curriculum specifically. Many of you might be familiar with this. It is in both the National Health Education Standards document. It's also in the HECAT, the Health Education Curriculum Analysis Tool. Um, and so you'll see it kind of over and over in a, in a variety of documents. This one goes over um, some specific things. And it talks about, um, for example, being skills-based, it talks about not using scare tactics, it talks about um, using um, norm behaviors, um, it talks about using culturally responsive curriculum to make sure that um, it is appropriate for your students and the uh, you know, culture and ethnicities of your students. Um, so this is a deeper dive specifically into curriculum, doesn't really go over policy and environment. So I just made this slide because I don't want to reinforce ineffective practices. Uh, when I do this in person, I do this as a red, green, yellow light activity where I give you practices and you kind of put them in different um, criteria piles. Um, but for, for, for a webinar, I just wanted to say, you know, I've talked a little bit about some documents that support the effective practices. We're not going to get into the nitty gritty of what they all say. Um, but some of the ineffective practices that we've seen over time in health education include scare tactics. And I do have some research around scare tactics if you, if you want some of that and that's helpful for you. Um, information only health education, um, meaning, you know, reading a, a specific textbook um, on a specific chapter um, and that's it is not effective. Um, not having relevant lessons or information, so they're not relevant to students um, because it's not appropriate for their age or it's not something that they're living through uh, can be ineffective. Making sure it's you know, culturally competent. Um, and then ill-informed instruction, so not using data to drive curricular decisions. And that could be, like I hear sometimes, well, I always teach this unit, so how would I not teach this unit? Or, but kids love this stuff. And so that's great, but just because kids love this stuff doesn't, definitely doesn't mean that um, it's relevant or even it's data-driven. So we'll talk about data in a little bit. So just in review for this first kind of tip of that diamond piece, um, I just wanna talk about you know, the, the four pieces. So uh, you have your central components that Shape America did, that's the bigger environmental support that comes with a second document that is a checklist. Okay, so it's that kind of, almost like a rubric or a checklist to determine if you have those essential components in place. We have the effective practices in health education, so that's specifically to your program. And then we also have the effective practices uh, that is on Centers for Disease Control site, um, and it's specifically more around curriculum and instruction. So what I'd like to do now, it's just the last of the polls uh, today, um, is again, go back to Slido and put in 84183. Uh, and I just um, have a very simple last question. This is the last poll of today, um, but it's an open-ended one and you can um, answer multiple times if you'd like. But the question is, how could you use these documents or how do you currently use them? So it could be in pre-service prep, it could be um, I'm gonna ask my administrator to uh, evaluate me on the effective practices. I know we didn't do a deep dive into all the um, all the programs and the documents. I, I get that, but overall, just based on what you heard, if you could kind of add maybe some you know tidbits of oh that would be a really cool document that I could use to do this. So I'm going to mute myself for a minute and um, see what pops up.
just looking at the answers and what people are, are you know, kind of posting. I also know some health educators that will um, set a goal, a professional goal every year, and they'll use that um, appropriate practices document from SHAPE um, to make an advocacy goal. Um, so maybe they'll write their legislator once a month and advocate for their you know, health program, um, or they'll go to, um, you know, speak out day in DC with Shape America, um, or a professionalism goal around going to a, you know, local PD event that they've never been. So again, it can even be like personal goal setting. Um, but I do encourage you all to check out those resources and, and to see how they help guide and support you and your program. So thank you all for answering these. And I'm going to hold on to these data, because um, it's just great to read through and, um, review what you're all putting down. So thanks so much for participating. I'm going to switch back over and make sure it's just still on my desktop. Okay. So we just talked about the effective practices and um, what I'd like to do now is talk about the National Health Education Standards. So some of you might be really familiar with the National Health Education Standards um, that was published in 2006, the most uh, recent version. Um, I was fortunate enough when I was at the Oregon Department of Education to be on the panel with about, I think there were 18 of us to develop these standards. And um, so you'll see the book and the image on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side are the list of um, the standards, just kind of a little clearer. So I just wanna talk a little bit about um, these standards and the way that I typically, like in person, would teach these. So um, standard one, I wanna just kind of call out standard one. Standard one is concepts, and it's students will comprehend concepts related to health promotion and disease prevention. So the, this is the standard that we want students to know. So it's the knowledge standard. And typically the way that I visually in my head see this is this is where your units are. Like this is where your content units are. So whether that's promotion of healthy eating or sexual health or violence prevention or disease prevention, that's the content pieces. It's the kind of functional information, what we want students to know um, in order to kind of get to a behavioral outcome. And that's the knowledge piece. Standards two through eight, demonstration. These are the skill standards. So when we talk about skills-based health education, what we're seeing is that we, we aren't just focusing on standard one, um, which is what we used to do a lot of times, um, but we're also integrating in skills. And that doesn't mean that you're not going to have a day or a lesson where you're heavily talking about concepts and you're teaching some of that functional base information. That's not what I'm saying, um, but it really is the focus of your units are going to always have opportunities to introduce a skill, practice it, and get to proficiency, all right? Um, and it's really up to you and local control what you kind of weave together and align together, meaning what content and what skills do you want to kind of pair together? And that's a lot of scope and sequence work, which I do with districts very often is, okay, if we're gonna be teaching promotion of healthy eating or nutrition in seventh grade, what skills do we feel like are really important during that unit? Maybe one skill we'll focus on, maybe two. But you also have to look at what does it mean, um, like what is sixth grade doing, what is eighth grade doing, and what other skills and other units have we already covered? So that's why it can get a little bit kind of um, complicated doing scope and sequences. So overall, this is how I kind of visually see the, the standards. Um, so I wanted to share, since Jamie Sparks was helping me with the tech piece, um, is they have a, uh, ETR Associates has a free poster. So if you are interested in these free posters, it's a download and it comes in different colors. And then the back has more information of it. Um, I'm going to be sharing free resources all week. Here is one. Um, and so the URL is up there. I actually put it in this slide. Um, but again, uh, you'll get the slide and the URL is in the, the notes as well. So if you are interested in a free poster, um, I've blown mine up really big and they 
they have, um, I've laminated them. So um, I love it and it's super colorful because my old posters were really, really boring. <laughs> So when we talk about the content um, and we talk about the units, the typical units, um, they can be anything like any of these. And you might call yours nutrition and not promotion of healthy eating and you know whatever you choose. I've always liked prevention of or promotion of. I feel like that is very action oriented. So instead of saying we're doing the nutrition unit, I like the promotion of healthy eating. And you know, there are a lot of semantics around a lot of these pieces. You might call it, have to call it family health versus sexual health. Um, but overall, I like the kind of prevention of or promotion of because I feel like it's very active and I think that's important. Um, but overall, we've um, had a lot of discussion in health education in the world of health education about what skills base means. And typically, most of us, I probably should have done a poll, um, typically most of us have taught units based in these topics, right? So you start the year and you might start with like mental and emotional health, and then you might end your semester with, for example, like sexual health, because you don't typically start with sexual health at the beginning of the semester or the year, right? Um, and so we kind of work through these unit topics. There's been some conversation about what if we flipped that? And what if the units were actually the skills, the skill standards? So at the beginning of the year, maybe you would start with accessing information and you would incorporate the content into that. Now that is a whole nother webinar and something that I'm not offering this week, but maybe I will. Um, and if you wanna hear more about kind of the theory and the thought about that and would it work and does it work and how complicated does that get? I did write a blog post on it uh, with some references and some resources on it. So if you are interested um, in um, a uh, reading a blog post about an aha that I had, um, if you, it's called Defining Skills-Based Health Education and what it actually means. And it's on the Karen Guidance website. So you can see at the bottom of these slides, the website, just go to the blog page. Um, and at the right hand side, you can look up health education. And I think it might be under there. I don't remember the exact date, but again, once you get this PowerPoint, I've hyperlinked it. So um, both the slide and at the bottom has the exact link to this. And I'll try and remember to tweet out later or post out later the exact link to the blog because there's a lot of blogs and I don't want you to spend time doing that. But what it talks about is this idea of like, am I still doing skills-based health education if my units are content? Yeah, definitely. As long as you're integrating skills into those content areas, then what does it mean if you're doing units that are based on the skills and you're integrating content? I believe that's also skills-based. So um, there's you know, different theories there. Um, we don't have a lot of research and data around it, but there's more information on the blog. Um, and I have written one unit that is based on analyzing influences for high school that has three content areas. Um, and it's on a, a website that I have up and I'm not gonna give it to you right now because it's just too much information, but it is linked to that blog and you're more than, you're more than welcome to use those lessons uh, and give me some feedback on it as I continue to develop uh, the health literacy for life um, lessons that I've been doing. So I just wanna move over to data, um, which is part of the diamond as well, um, as you can see. And um, you know, data is really important. I will never forget one of my first years at the Department of Education. I was doing a training and a teacher said to me, well, I spend like a week on cocaine prevention. Now this was a really long time ago, but I was like, I don't think your students are doing cocaine. And so it was like, what are your students doing? What are they doing well? What are they participating in that's healthy? Um, and what are the things that you have are concerning behaviors to you? And I think it's really important that you are aware to the best of your ability what's going on in your community with your students. You might not be able to access behavioral data from your local students. That like totally might be the case. So um, what you might be able to do is access national data, regional data, statewide data, so you do the best you can. So I have a screenshot here um, of the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. Every state calls it something a little different, uh, so you'd have to look at your own state's data. Um, again, the slide has the URL in it, um, but overall, understanding what behaviors your students are participating in is really helpful. So let me give you an example of that. If we were to do some data-driven unit planning, all right, here's a high school example. 
among 34% of currently active students nationwide, about 60% reported that they or their partner had used a condom during last intercourse. That's 40% that haven't, all right? So just kind of think about that. Here's another data point from that same year. Almost 21% of students had five or more drinks of alcohol in a row within a couple of hours on at least one day during the last 30 days before the survey. So that's binge drinking to an extent. So what I'd like to ask you to do is in the chat box, if you knew, if you were a high school teacher, I know you're not all high school teachers, and these were two data points that impacted your students. Um, thank you, Jonathan, for putting the URL for ETR. I appreciate that. I just saw that pop up. What would you focus on here? What would your unit or lessons be around? What might be the content pieces and what might be some of the skills related to condom use, contraception use, but also alcohol use? So if you could put in the chat, we're not going to do it through Slido, just put in the chat, like, what might you teach about? Uh, what would be the content? What would be the skills that you might want your students to be able to demonstrate in order to address these two very concerning data points? I'm just going to mute myself while people answer. And Yeah, these are great. A lot of communication skills, decision-making skills, goal setting, impacts of alcohol on brain development and decision-making. Um, so this is great. So this is exactly, now you, you, then you'd go to, well, I only have eight days you know, to teach to address these concerning data points. So you have to think about it, or you might only have four days to teach it or two days. So that's kind of the beginning of where we'll continue to go this week as we kind of build on each of the um, you know, series. But the idea is looking at those data and saying, okay, this might not specifically be my students um, because this might be state level data or national data, but I do know that there are students that aren't using contraception. I do know that there are students that are binge drinking and I have some concerns. So, you know, probably important to address some of those skill pieces. Just getting up and showing a video um, on, you know, the impact of binge drinking, not as effective as having students participate in decision making, goal setting, advocacy, some of those communication skills um, and standards that we talked about. So perfect example. Thank you for participating and, um, you know, adding some of your thoughts because it just, it gives, every time I see a data point, I try and think through the lens of, how do I address this one? What is age appropriate? What is culturally competent and how I address it? And tomorrow when I introduce the health education curriculum analysis tool, you'll see that there are lists and lists of healthy behavior outcomes, knowledge expectations and skill expectations to draw from so that you don't have to come up with this stuff from your head, but you can actually draw from those to say, oh, that would be a great lesson. Um, that skill expectation in the HECAT would be a great start to a lesson or it'd be a great way to, you know, have kids do um, a carousel activity around the room. And so again, it doesn't all have to come from in here. There are so many resources out there that help me uh, revise curriculum for um, companies and organizations and develop it from scratch. So getting to the end uh, of this webinar and overall wanna talk about policy just really briefly um, as the fourth kind of foundational component. And this is a very, um, you know, local piece here. Uh, we don't have 
uh, tons of national policies that tell us like what to teach in health education. And it's mostly state level, it's mostly state run, uh, local control, we call it. Um, and so I just wanna share with you kind of two state policies. Um, your district might have other policies, but overall uh, these policies are you know, specific to teaching health education. If you're not familiar with NASB, National Association of uh, State Boards of Education, they actually have a great um, health policy database and you can actually look at all the health education uh, policies around the country um, that departments of ed submit. Um, so that's actually a really great um, tool if you want to see your own state's policy. You can also go to your department of ed, of course, um, but NASB does a great job of kind of showing an overall picture of what states have policies around having to teach mental health, for example, or having to teach alcohol prevention. Um, so that's a NASB, N-A-S, be.org. Yes, Daniel, you got that. N-A-S-B-E. I'll type it right here just as, um, and it is their, I think it's called their uh, school health policy database, I want to say. I know that they kind of, let me make sure this is going to everybody. Uh, that didn't go to everybody. Make sure you all have that because I forgot to put it in. So check that out because that would be really helpful to see kind of um, what your policies are. So here are just a couple of examples. Um, here's a New York one. Some of you are very familiar with this one. Um, I think a couple of states on the East Coast have adopted statewide policy that all students in all grades must receive instruction on mental health. Um, as you can imagine, um, the plans behind that as far as implementation, look different everywhere. Um, some of them are very broad. So if you look at this one, include mental health in the relation of physical and mental health and enhance student understanding attitudes and behaviors that promote health, well-being, and human dignity. So that's New York's. There are there's more language in it, but you know, it doesn't really give a specific scope and sequence. It doesn't talk about, for example, um, you know, good mental health and sleep or, you know, mental health and exercise or accessing a mental health provider in your school. It doesn't get that detailed. Um, so a lot of local districts are having to kind of come up with their scope and sequences to fulfill these policies. Uh, but as these roll out, obviously that changes. So that's a mental health one. The Oregon one, this is tiny, but the Oregon one I wanted to share because I was a part of this one when I was at Department of Ed. This is a, Oregon's comprehensive sexual health policy. Um, it's very comprehensive. It talks about being medically accurate. Um, it talks about uh, students with uh, sexual minority, uh, talking about sexual minority students being inclus included in the conversation. It talks about consent. Um, and so again, if you're going to teach uh, sex education in Oregon, you really have to follow these policies. So I just encourage you to look at your state and district policies around teaching health education uh, before jumping into things and just making sure that you're aligned to policy. So in review, um, here are your kind of four foundational pieces. Uh, we went over the effective practices and some of the documents uh, and supporting documents for you there. Uh, we talked very briefly about the National Health Education Standards. I know majority of you are familiar with them, um, but a little bit of an introduction. We talked about data and the importance of data-driven decision-making in health education and then importance of policy. So those are what I believe are the kind of foundational pieces of health education. And I hope that you got some more out of, you know, your, uh, you got more for your toolbox or toolkit uh, for teaching health education. So just a few closing pieces before I close today. Um, just a reminder, the webinar series, um, tomorrow I'll be talking about the HECAT, the Health Education Curriculum Analysis Tool and how you can use it to unit plan going into assessment on Wednesday and then no cost tools on Thursday. Um, it appears as though um, I have an, a Zoom account um, that um, I can take up to 500 people and apparently it, it only allowed 100 to participate today. So I've been, it's kind of why I was a little distracted at the beginning. I've been getting text messages of people that can't get in. Um, so I'm gonna do my best to get that going for tomorrow to make sure that 
everyone um, can access these because I did have about 275 people um, signed up today. So quite a few obviously couldn't get into this webinar today live and hopefully they'll watch it uh, recorded. Um, so hopefully tomorrow um, we won't have an issue with that. But I did want to mention that uh, that that was an issue today, unfortunately. Um, the other piece is um, I'm hoping to develop a next webinar series. Um, I do have client work that I've been working on at home. Obviously, I'm at home too, even though I travel a lot typically. I've been home for about six and a half weeks. Um, but um, I'm hoping to develop another webinar series in a, in a couple of weeks. Um, it's not going to be specific on health education, curriculum, and instruction. More on the whole school, whole community, whole child framework. We call that WISC um, and the components of the whole child framework and how health education actually plays a role in that framework. So we'll, we'll be uh, starting to develop that probably next week and I'll keep you posted. If you want to stay connected, you can go to my website. Um, there is a contact us page. Um, you can just write in the, you know, um, in the content, you know, add me to the newsletter and then you'll get updates on this. I honestly send a newsletter post out maybe once a month maybe four times a year. So you wouldn't get bombarded. You can always opt out or unsubscribe. Um, but if you do want to keep in touch uh, for the time being, as we are at home right now, if I continue to develop these webinar series, uh, feel free to, to write us and sign up for the, the newsletter it's through MailChimp. Um, and we'll keep you posted that way. You can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter. I've been posting these pieces as well. Finally, a lot of you are asking how I get all this stuff. A couple of things. So on the left-hand side of this slide, you can see uh, a QR code. Uh, you can hold up your phone uh, and go to take a picture, but don't take a picture. And a web browser may show up, depending on the type of phone you have. It'll bring you right to that YouTube channel. Um, and that will be where this recorded webinar will be. It's not going to be there right now. But hopefully by the end of today, I'll have it up there and ready to go. On the right-hand side of this slide, all the Google folders. So this PowerPoint with all the URLs, um, everything will be in that Google folder. Um, and uh, let me actually stop, change my share, because I'm going to see, I don't know if I can. Yeah, I don't think I can get into my notes. Yes, I can. I'm gonna try and give you all in the, Let's see. I know you're seeing a lot of different things here. Sorry about that. I'm trying, I don't think I can find it right now, but um, what I was trying to do was show you um, the URL for the Google folders, but I will um, make sure that I have all your emails through a recipient list for your registration. I'll make sure that you get that. But the QR code's not working. Um, email me at info at karenguidance.com. I want to make sure you have all the materials that you need, the recorded webinar from today, um, and also um, the, uh, so the YouTube channel, all the materials. Oh, and this PowerPoint, which will have all the URLs at the bottom. So Thank you all for participating. I have never done a webinar with this many people, so thanks for kind of hanging in there. Um, the next few days, we'll build on each other. Hopefully, we'll get more people that can uh, sign in. Um, seeing all of you say thank you. Have a great rest of your day. Stay healthy and safe, and thanks for tuning in. Thanks, everybody. Bye.